healing is a redemptive truth. It's part of the plan of redemption. Um, and so, so, you know, just as the Word of God is an ever-present truth and some truths, uh, we must continually refresh ourselves on certain things uh, lest we let them slip. You know, if you don't hear something for a while, you can get away from you. Um, you know, you can, hear, you can hear scriptures about confession or about believing God for prosperity or different things, and if you don't keep those things fresh before you, they'll get away from you. And so we want to make sure that we don't let those things get away from us. Amen. Isn't that right? We want to okay, get up here where we're supposed to be. Hallelujah. We want to keep them constantly fresh with, with us. Um, and so let's look at uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Hallelujah. You know, the word, you know, we just don't, we just don't want to let stuff get away from us. You're constantly bombarded by stuff. People are constantly bombarded by stuff. And, and there's a lot of stuff out there just designed by the devil to take faith out of you. Joshua 1, uh, 7 and 8 says, Only be strong and very courageous, that thou mayest deserve to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it from the right hand or the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Hallelujah. Um, with the information world becoming the intellectual playground for the minds of millions of people, and the free access to these mediums grant to anyone access to the internet to publish anything they desire, anything for anyone to read, we're faced with an equally as fast and urgent cry of the Holy Ghost to come away and know him and his word as never before. It is with these thoughts in mind that I approach this subject of the redemptive plan of God to heal man's body from all sickness and disease. We have, you're constantly bombarded. There's constant information out there. People putting stuff on the internet. You know, <clears throat> it's like that commercial. Have you ever seen that commercial? Where the girl says she's, she, she met a guy online and, um, and, and, you know, she said, and she said, well, they can't put anything on the internet. It's not true. She, and the guy says, where'd you hear that from? He, she said, the internet. And uh, she's cutting the guy, this, this goofy guy comes walking down the sidewalk, and uh, she says, there's my, there's my date. He's a French model. And he kind of walks up all slouched, you know, kind of, and he goes, bonjour, you know? And uh, he's, 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 and, and she just puts her arm around and walks off, because he's a French model. Why? Because the internet said so. Just, you know, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure what kind of, what was he modeling? He was modeling caveman clothes. Hallelujah. Understand, people print stuff, people write books, people put stuff out there, they blog stuff on the internet, don't make it right. We have to come aside to what the Word of God says. Amen? And, uh, and get our minds renewed to the Word. Hallelujah. And so, W. F.F. Um, F. Bosworth in his book, Christ the Healer, says this, Appropriating faith cannot go beyond one's knowledge of the revealed will of God. Christ the Healer, the book Christ the Healer, Bosworth says, Appropriating faith. Well, what, what kind of faith do you want? Faith that gets the answer. Appropriating faith. Amen. Cannot go beyond one's knowledge of the revealed will of God. See, you have to be revealed to you. You have to understand it for you. You have to have revelation of it. Amen. We can put it another way. Faith begins where the will of God is known. That's how Dad Hagen used to say it. To anyone who desires to receive any blessing from God, including healing, it is imperative that the word of God on the matter be understood. Solomon says it this way in, in Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life to those that find them. And health, or as one translation says, medicine to all their flesh. Amen? We have to let the word of God be medicine to our flesh. <clears throat> so, Bosworth went on and said this. He said, until we know what God's will is, there's nothing to base our faith on. Until you know what God's will is. Well, you don't believe God. Well, I, you know, is God going to do such and such for you? Well, I sure hope so. What you just told me is you don't know what his will is. Once you know what his will is, then you can have something to base your faith on. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? Anything else is futile. When God's will is known and acted upon then and only then is faith released. And can there be faith results? Romans 12, 2 tells us that we are to be transformed 
by the renewing of our minds. This mind renewal breaks world conformity, world thinking, and most importantly, world limitations. Yeah. Amen? So you sound like you're reading this. Yeah, I wrote it. Okay? It's so hard for me to read what I wrote, isn't it? We serve a limitless God with limitless power. It is our duty to feed upon the word and to hear it taught and preached. For in so doing, we position ourselves to be men and women of faith. Why? Because Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. God has given his word to us to reveal his will to us. The Holy Spirit was sent to teach us that, teach us that word and to reveal it to us. John 16, 13 uh, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In other words, if the Holy Ghost is revealing it, he's going to reveal to you the will of the Father. Now, let me say this. If he's revealing the will of the Father, he's sharing the scriptures with you. Amen? He's sharing what the Word says with you. This is my electronic Bible. Hallelujah. It's my Bible. It's my very own Bible. I believe what it says. I can have what it says I can have. I am what it says I am. And I can do what it says I can do. Amen. Hallelujah. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So, and his work, and, and then, then 1 John 2, 20 and 27, but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Then verse 27, but the anointing that abideth within you, Abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth and is no lie, even as it taught you, it sh you shall abide in him. We have an unction and we have an anointing in us. The Holy Ghost is the teacher. He will confirm and bear witness to you the will of God from the word of God. Amen. That's why it's important that we, we make a decision that our, that, uh, that uh, even like the Bereans, they received the word of God with all readiness of mind, but search the scriptures. To see whether those things be so or not. Why? Because unless you know from the word yourself, it won't profit you. Yeah. You know, Hebrews chapter 10 talks about the Jews. And it said, the word did not profit them not being mixed with faith. We have to, we, we have to base it on what the word says. Amen? When the word is revealed to us, faith accompanies it. And we can and must act on the word. Amen? Receive you with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Amen? Isn't that, what, isn't that what the word of God says in James? Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Hallelujah. So in order for us to lay a good foundation on this subject, we must go to the beginning of all things to establish God's original purpose for man. Then we will understand God's will for man. This is a, normally a three-part sermon. I'm going to try to get it out in one night. Because I want to get these truths out to you. You know, I don't have time to do three services on this one thing. So I'm not going. I'm going to try to self rabbit trails. Pray for me. <laughs> okay. Then we'll understand God's will for man, and God's will is birthed out of His purpose. One must be a careful student of the first three chapters of Genesis. In the first chapter, we see the hand of the Creator carefully laying out the groundwork for a special creation, man. After each endeavor, the Word says that God saw it was good. Now God said that different things. He said, and it was good. And this, and it was good. And this, and it was good. And I believe we got the man said he was, and yet when he created man, he saw that it was very good. Amen. God created things good. He created man very good. We see no sign of sickness, pain, defeat in mankind until after the fall. Then and only then, because of the trees of the man, did the wrath of Satan begin to take its toll on the wonderful creation of God. Satan began to pervert, every, pervert everything God created. Righteousness became a sinful nature. Prosperity became poverty. Life became death. And health became sickness. It was not so in the beginning. It became so after the fall. This is stated in order to show God's purpose in man's creation. This purpose is his will. This is further uh, carried um, this is further carried forth and revealed in the first compound covenant name of God that he gave to the children of Israel, Jehovah Rapha, in Exodus 15, 26. If you would diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God <coughs> and do that which is right in his sight and will give to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases or allow 
which I have brought or allowed upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee in the, in the Hebrew, that is, I am Jehovah Rapha. Last phrase in this passage is, I am the Lord that healeth thee. The Hebrew says, I am Jehovah Rapha. This is the first compound covenant name that God gave to Israel, and that covenant name revealed a covenant of help. Why? Because God's purpose for man was help, and his will was revealed in his name. Now, Dr. Schofield, in his study Bible, the Schofield Study Bible, um, hallelujah, now I'll just tell you, the Baptists have a Schofield Bible like Charismatics have a Copeland Bible. All right, hallelujah. But Dr. Schofield said, Jehovah is distinctly the redemptive name of deity and means the self-existent one who reveals himself. The seven compound redemptive names point to a continuous and increasing self-revelation. In his redemptive relation to man, Jehovah has seven compound names which reveal him as meeting every need of man for, the lost, for his lost state to the end. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there or present. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord is my provider. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner or victor or captain. Jehovah Tzitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. And then Jehovah Rapha, which is really the first one. We just made it last in my list. The Lord our physician or the Lord that healeth thee. Here we have the seven redemptive names of God. And Hebrew tells us that in Hebrews 8, 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much more he is a mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, <clears throat> I just read off seven things that God said about himself in covenant relationship with Israel, and yet the Word of God says we have a better covenant. Now let me tell you something. If you got a car, and it's got all the bells and whistles on it, and you go get a new car, and it's stripped down, it doesn't have power or anything, no power windows, doesn't even have a radio in it, doesn't have power seats, doesn't have power locks, doesn't have remote control, doesn't have, you know, automatic cranking. I mean, you got to get out and, and do the old Model T hand crank thing. If you, uh, you don't have a car established upon better, better technology. Amen? You trade it down. You take your car in there, you got power windows, power seats, power door locks, power mirrors. I mean, you know, power trunk, power antenna, power everything. And then you get something that has got no, nothing on it, wanting to start itself, then, then you, don't have a better, you don't have a better deal. And see, when we came into the new covenant, we got all the good stuff and more. Amen? So I'm asking, are you to believe that, that a new and a better covenant does not include the redemptive aspects of the old? Certainly not. Especially with the evidence the scriptures produced to nullify such um, ludicrous thinking. That's what I put in my, when I wrote this. <coughs> I was trying to make sure I said it really nice. Try to be nice. Hallelujah. All right, let's get some symbolism. The, the brazen serpent. Uh, the Word of God is its own commentator on the subject. Look first at the brazen serpent, clearly a type of Christ. Numbers 21, 9. Remember, the uh, fire serpent started, came out and started biting the people when they sinned and rebelled. And then the, then the people cried out to Moses. Moses went to God. God told Moses and um, said, Make a serpent of brass. If they look on it, they'll live. And so Numbers 21, 9, And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Well, that was a typology. And, and you know, many of you have seen ambulances, and you've seen the logo on the back of, a, of, a, of an ambulance or, or hospital, uh, hospitals or whatever, and it's a snake on a, on, on a pole. It's a serpent on a brass pole. It's a brazen serpent. And it is the sign, you think, if you don't know your Bible, you'll go, what in the world? Have they got a snake on a pole for an ambulance? Because it's the symbol from the Old Covenant of, hell, uh, of, of redemptive healing. And we still, we still use it in an agnostic, atheistic, pluralistic society. They still use a biblical reference for healing. And so Jesus in John, the third chapter, um, 14 and 15, this is after John, you know, after John said, you know, after Jesus said, um, 
Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Then he comes back and finishes, it says this, And as Moses, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, this is preceded by these, pre these verses right here. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So Jesus says that the brazen serpent is a typology of him. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever eternal life. Now, Jesus said, I'm, just as the serpent lifted up and healed the people's redemptive truth, healing belonged to them, he had to be lifted up. Now, not only was he going to heal people, he was going to redeem them from sin. But part of, that, part of that process included physical health and healing. Amen? And um, uh, E.W. Kenyon said something really interesting. He said it this way. He said, if the type would heal, that's the brazen serpent, how much more the antitype heal? The brazen serpent was a type of Jesus, and if you looked at it, you could get healed. Hello? Jesus being the antitype, and which is simply a fancy way of saying the real. He's not the type, he, uh, he's the actual. But when you're using it in, these, in, in this comparison, you use the term type and antitype. <clears throat> so Jesus being the antitype, if you could look at the type and get healed, how in the world could you not look at the type, the antitype, and not get healed? But people teach that. Hello? There is a thesis established there in, in, in the book of Numbers that the brazen serpent, if you looked at that in faith, you were healed, and then you come, here comes the antithesis, Jesus, and say you can't get healed by looking at him. And he's the real, of which the type was a type of. Yes, you can be healed by looking at Jesus, by looking to Jesus. Amen? Isaiah 53, hallelujah, I'm telling you, if you just get into faith, you can receive from God. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6, and then 10 through 12. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows or pains. I'm going to give you the, uh, the side translation. And acquainted with grief, better translated sickness. And as we hear as it were our faces from him, he was despised, we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our sicknesses, carried our pains, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep are gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Now, King James says grief, but that word in the Hebrew is sickness. He has put him, he has, uh, one translation actually says, he's made him sick. When he shall make, and, and when? Thou shalt make his soul an offering for our sin. He made him sick when he made his soul an offering for our sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He should divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah. Again, the word translated um, pain here. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. The word translated grief comes from koile, uh, and I'm not really sure if I pronounced that right, C-H-O-L-I. O L I Y, really bad translated sickness. And then the word translated uh, sorrows is mechab, and it's better translated pain, physical pain. Hallelujah. And so, the, you know, the better translations are sickness and not grief. Hallelujah. Now, Matthew 8 17 in, in here says, verse, actually back at 16, when the evening was come, they brought in him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits that were with his word and healed all that were sick. That he might be fulfilled, which was spoken, Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Hallelujah. Notice that, that Isaiah said, actually uses the word sicknesses. Hallelujah. And then 1 Peter 2.24 says, uh, who, are, who bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being the dead to sin shall live in the righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. And so these three passages held in combination one with the other uh, clearly reveals 
that God's will is, is that physical diseases were part of the redemptive plan of God through Jesus Christ. Okay, and so we've shown that it's a part of that. Uh, and if it's part of redemption, then it must be concluded that healing is for all in the will of God. Hallelujah. You know, look at the ministry of Jesus. And um, where, where Jesus ministered, he says in John 6, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. John 14, 9, Jesus said, I have been with you so long. Have you not known me, Philip? He that seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest you show me the Father? Believe not that I am in the Father, the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you. I speak not of myself, <coughs> but the Father <coughs> dwelleth in me, and he doeth the works. Believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Here we have two passages of Scripture that makes it very clear. Everything Jesus did was the will of the Father. Amen? Hallelujah. He healed. He forgave. Raised the dead. Ministered the life of God. Hallelujah. Amen? And the Word of God says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change His plan. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, a lot of times what people really want to know is, they see, pe Christians will usually go, God can heal. So if you, if you believe in God, if you believe in God, there's no way you can't believe that God can do something. They usually get hung up on His, his will. God came to Jesus one day in Matthew 8, 2, and 3 and said this, Behold, a certain leper came and watched him, saying, Lord, if thou will, thou can make me clean. In other words, I know you can, but are you willing? You know what Jesus did? Put forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was clean. The leper knew that Jesus had the power. He only questioned the willingness to use it. And, and really, is that not how we are today? Is that not the state of the church today? You know, we know the Lord can heal. He's healed wonderfully, but we don't believe it is his will to heal everybody. What a sadistic trick to play on one of own, God, your own children. To bless one with good health and healing while afflicting others with cruel and evil, evil diseases would be insane. There's a psychological term for this kind of behavior. Schizophrenia. If people did that to their own kids, we'd put them in hospitals yeah. and put them on medicine. Yeah. Hello. If you have one parent going around and injecting their kids with AIDS and then giving other, other, uh, another child a miracle cure to heal them and keep them from being sick, we would call them evil. We'd say they were sick. We'd lock them away. We'd turn around and, do the same, and blame God for doing the same thing. Why? Because we're just uneducated in the biblical things. I was going to use another term, but I, it wasn't nice. <laughs> Stupid's not real nice. Anyway, hallelujah. Dumber than dirt's not nice, so I'm not going to say those things. <laughs> kind of like that courtroom thing where you put it out there, objection. You know, you, the jury is instructed to disregard that statement. Too late. <laughs> hallelujah. Jesus said he came to do the will of the Father. And when asked if it was his will to heal, he responded without hesitation that it was his will to heal. So much so that it was the earmark of his ministry. Think of the fact um, how the Bible describes Jesus. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went out about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went around about the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. There's a lot of other ministry gifts that Jesus flowed in. But healing became an earmark to his ministry. Amen. It didn't say Jesus went about round about teaching, preaching, and prophesying. It didn't say Jesus went round about teaching and preaching and having word of knowledge. It didn't say Jesus went round about preaching and teaching and uh, causing axe heads to float. Now I know he did, a lot of things happened in his ministry, but in giving a condensed synopsis of his ministry, he taught, preached, and healed. Amen. The thing that came away with people was he taught, preached, and healed. Other things happened. Dead were raised. Amen? Are you here? I mean, the dead were raised. Um, fishes and, and bread were multiplied. 
Taxes were supernaturally paid by going fishing. But the earmark of his ministry, yeah, we don't want Nathan to hear that. Nathan, take off and go fishing. Hallelujah. The earmark, that which, distinct, which, which was notable about his ministry was that he taught, he preached, and he healed. And he hadn't changed. And he said that whatever you see me do, I only do it because I see the Father do it. He establishes through his ministry that the will of the Father is to heal. John 10, 30 says, I and my Father are one. And Jesus said that him and his Father are one. It was, his, it was his nature to heal. And since him and his Father are one, it's the nature of the Father to heal. Why? Because just like God revealed in Exodus 15, 26, that he was Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee, his, God can't change. I am the Lord and I change not. God doesn't stop being the healer and become the oppressor. See, people get so messed up. They start making God the oppressor and not the healer when he was the healer. Jesus was anointed to carry out the will of the Father. Amen. Hebrews 13, 8, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Then parallel verses, Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The fact, is, the fact of the matter is this. God is the same. He is inherently Jehovah Rapha. He revealed that in a compound covenant name. Now Schofield once again says he's the self-existent one who reveals himself. And he revealed himself further in the compound names. What was that? He was revealing who he is. Amen. If not what he would do, who he is. I am the Lord, your healer. The Lord, thy physician. You can translate it different ways depending on how you do it. But the Lord, thy physician, the Lord, thy healer was revealed. Except where God says, I'm revealing an aspect of me. That's how the compound covenant names work. When God said, I am Jehovah Rapha, he was saying, I am the self-existent one, and I reveal myself to you, and in this name, I am revealing you an aspect of who I am. I am your healer. He says also your peace. He was your righteousness. You know, other things he shared. But he was your healer. He didn't change. I'm the Lord changed not. God doesn't change. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And he will not change his nature to appease a bunch of religious zealots who want to keep people away from his redemptive truths and to, in order to protect their pitiful doctrine. There you go. I just had to put it out there. God doesn't change just because you write a book. He didn't stop being who he is because you guys got together and said, well, we believe this. He's still the healer. Amen? Jesus is the healer. Amen. And if you'll lay hold by faith and receive, you can get the answers from heaven that the Word of God promises you. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the truth of your Word. Thank you that Jesus is our healer. We receive the goodness of God tonight in this place that you minister life to everybody that needs healing, liberate everyone that's bound, and we walk in the full redemptive truth of Jesus, our healer. In Jesus' name.